here we are another busy week <laughs> very busy to put it mildly yeah okay so there are quite a few things i want to talk about about mm. china let's start with china Mm. Um, what is your overall uh, impression about Schultz's visit? Now, the Chinese media, I just want to share with you, um, they think he got a lot. One is he got the uh, the beef ban. I didn't even know there's a beef ban of German beefs um, mm. lifted. So the ban, supposedly, I, I just read it, that it's not just against the, the, the German beef. It's uh, mm. in the beginning of this year, EU trying to making some trouble with China, just one of the things mm. they banned the Chinese meat, saying mm. it's not uh, up to the standard, whatever. And so in retaliation, China just banned all the EU meat. And mm. so now China lift not EU beef, but German beef. So that's one thing mm. that they got. But more importantly, it seems like a, we're talking about the China landscape, etc. I'm sure you're familiar with the city, uh, Chongqing, which mm. is in the west of China. And he visited Chongqing and lots of people were speculating why he visited Chongqing. Mm. So supposedly China's next step is to develop the west of China. Mm. So Chongqing mm. is a very important harp there. And not mm. only that, the, the, the west of China also down there is ASEAN countries. Mm. And then a little bit further out is the Central Asia countries. So, so this whole big area, a lot of things going on. And the, part of the reason the speculation is he visit there is because he, he wants Germany to be part of that development, the whole mm. Western China, ASEAN countries, Central mm. Asia. What is your overall impression? I think it, I think from Olaf Scholz's point of view, it was an absolutely essential visit that he had to do. Um, Germany is in um, severe economic problems. Apparently, they're getting worse. I mean, every so every so often we get an uptick in industrial production numbers, but all kinds of things have been going wrong. So Germany is in difficulties. China, we've just had figures. The economy, as we've been discussing in our recent programs, its growth has been stronger than had been anticipated. So you see, there is there is already an imbalance. Now. The Chinese, Xi Jinping in particular, but many Chinese officials have been telling to the Germans repeatedly, look, we've got a good relationship. We've had a very good relationship in the past. We've had good economic contacts. Um, you're, the Americans are coming. They're trying to get you to take sides, take sides against us. Look what happened to you when you did that with the Russians. We're a far more important economy for you than even the Russians are. For heaven's sake, don't spoil it in the same way. <laughs> and I think that Schultz has got that message. And I think basically one of the reasons he went to China was in order to reassure the Chinese that Germany still wants to have a strong and good relationship with China. And he was able to persuade some German business leaders to come with him. Not apparently quite the number that used to come when Angela Merkel used to visit China, but a lot of the key leaders from Siemens, from Daimler-Benz, from those places, they came with him as well. So I think in those terms, it was a satisfactory visit. The Chinese do not want to wreck the relationship with Germany. The mm -hmm. Germans, at least the more level-headed and sane ones also want to keep the relationship on a good track. That doesn't mean that they aren't there aren't differences. And I, I get the impression that Scholz was much more careful, for example, than Annalena Baerbock, Germany's disastrous foreign minister, has been uh, in avoiding, you know, infuriating the Chinese, giving them lectures, doing anything of that kind. But they did apparently have an in-depth discussion, Xi Jinping and Scholz, over the conflict in Ukraine. And mm -hmm. I have to say, reading the Chinese readout, it looked to me very much like Xi Jinping giving Scholz a lecture, <laughs> telling him, look, you've, you know, these are, you, you've got it all wrong. These are the four things you've got to do. You mustn't make things worse. You must yeah. stop sending weapons, stop being rude to the Russians, sit down and negotiate with them and make peace. I mean, you know, it was, it was you know, as, as clear as day, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I said in one of my own programs that I'd have loved to have been on a fly on the wall 
as that meeting uh, was <laughs> taking place. But anyway, the Chinese seem to have persuaded the Germans, or at any rate, Olaf Scholz. We got our major differences over Ukraine. You're getting it all completely wrong. We're not going to change our policies because you want us to change our policies. But what we want you to do and what the Germans have said, basically, that they'll agree to do is that you park this. You put this issue of Ukraine to one side. You talk about it and discuss it. But you don't lecture the Chinese. You don't tell them, you know, stop your relations with the Russians mm -hmm. or anything of that kind. So that the relationship, the economic, the vital economic trade relationship between Germany and China can just move on. And I think that is how it, it panned out over the course of this visit. And you're quite right. He went to Chongqing. I believe, by the way, that it's uh, now widely seen as the biggest industrial conurbation in the world mm -hmm. apparently it's a huge place of course mm -hmm. i've never been there but that's what yeah. i understand former capital of china by mm -hmm. the way yeah. as i also understand so um anyway so he went to chongqing um it's a major economic industrial technological hub china's western regions have in recent years there's not always been so but in recent years they've been less developed than the Mm -hmm. um, Eastern Seaboard, but that's changing. And the Germans want to be part of that. They want to be able to supply the machine tools and the equipment that they have been providing to China in order to just get the German economy uh, moving in the right direction again. And I think the Chinese, practical people as they are, said, fine, why not? I mean, it's, you know, we'll do it. If you want us to do it, we'll do it. Apparently, uh, now this is not just a plan that the China come up with yesterday, right? So China mm. is doing things very uh, long term planning. So mm. developing mm. the West is that on schedule. That's what they're going to do. Mm. And so apparently, when they were doing the planning, they were even thinking to get the U.S. involved. That was originally <laughs> the plan to have some mm. U.S. industry mm. coming in, maybe investment and stuff like that. But of mm. course, now it's it's not going to happen which i think is a big loss for the u.s right that could be a lot mm -hmm. of opportunities there very unfortunate you know um <laughs> also the the visit burbach and the habak the greens they were not there habak is the minister of a, of a economy or something mm -hmm. now it's probably no secret he does not get along with the greens right oh absolutely i mean this is uh, i mean the the german coalition is under intense stress I mean, the various parts of it don't get on with each other at all. So I think Scholz is exasperated with Baerbock and Habeck. Um, his electoral base, which once upon a time was a working class one, people mm -hmm. who work in factories. I don't know how many of them are left in Germany now, how many of them vote um, SPD any longer. But anyway, um, they're, not an, they're not obvious or natural allies, the SPD and the Greens. So there are tensions. And, of course, the relations between the Greens and the other coalition party, the F FPD, the Liberal Party, which controls the finance ministry, are known to be poisonous. And Schultz, absolutely correctly, as you absolutely rightly say, he goes to China and it's conspicuous that he keeps the Greens as far away as possible. So Baerbock, who's the foreign minister, isn't coming along on a foreign visit. And uh, even more importantly, Habeck, who's the economics minister in a summit that's going to be mainly about economics. He yeah. isn't there either. And that that tells you, and I think this is something that the Chinese will have noticed, that tells you that you can make arrangements, agreements with Olaf Scholz. But unfortunately, it's far from a foregone conclusion that Germany as a whole will stay by them. Because the Greens are a political force in Germany, whether one likes that fact or not. So I, I think the Chinese understand that. And I'm afraid that will limit the level of cooperation that there might have been. By the way, your point about, you know, the China wanting to involve the United States in developing the West of China, which is and absolutely, you're absolutely right, it's been a long-running plan. I, I have a friend of mine called Kerry Brown, who's a China 
expert, a good one, I think. He's been talking about this for a long time. I think he's even written books about this. Um, but, you know, getting the Americans involved was an excellent idea. I mean, why not? <laughs> why not? I mean, it would. Yeah, I mean, it makes, uh, makes complete sense to do that. By the way, it's not widely known, but the Russians also wanted to do the same. They extended invitations to the Americans to help them to develop the north... Uh, the northern northeast of Siberia, you know, where there's massive oil and gas deposits and where they're building the northern sea route. And some American companies like Exxon were very keen. Yeah. Of course, that didn't happen. And it doesn't seem as if it's happening with the west of China either. Mm -hmm. And China has all the resources it needs to develop all this place by itself. Mm -hmm. Germany looks like it wants to become involved. Mm -hmm. Um and it developed it will be and if we go back to eastern siberia well the russians probably can't develop it all by themselves they probably don't have those resources so who are they turning to now they're turning to china to help them do it <laughs> yeah the us have this in somehow have this idea that if they don't get involved the then the the world will stop, <laughs> right? <laughs> that that people seems cannot find alternatives. That they still have that mentality. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is this is the fundamental core fallacy of American policy on every almost every subject. The Americans believe that without them, nothing is possible, which yeah. might have been true once, you know, thirty, forty, fifty years ago. It's certainly not true today. Yeah. Regarding uh, uh, Burbach, I, the Greens in general, I, I still, I mean, they are very ideological, isn't it? But, mm. but being ideological doesn't explain their hostile towards China. Uh, Burbach, uh, last year when she was visiting Australia, this is what she said. She said, China poses a challenge to the fundamentals of how we live together in, the, in this world. This is a very strong statement. And of course, irritates a lot of Chinese and the netizens are saying, well, China is not going anywhere. If you don't want to live in this world with us, you have to move to Mars or, or wherever. Mm -hmm. So it, part of the reason could also be China simply doesn't want her to come. Now, Habak has never visited China. So maybe just fundamentally he's against China. Why the hostile towards China from the Greens? Yeah. So China made I so mean much progress in the green area. <laughs> partly the reason but before we proceed i mean what what bear box said which is absolutely in character with the way she usually talks um is not diplomacy which is what you would expect a foreign minister to be about it is its opposite i mean it is uh coming from a a, a supposed diplomat it's one of the most extraordinary statements you could possibly make i mean you know offend uh the world's second most powerful country <laughs> entirely needlessly yeah. and you know the world's biggest economy entirely needlessly and talking that uh, fantastically rude way which is she re regularly and always and invariably does it i mean it is incredible why are the greens like they are now this is one of the great unanswered questions for me because of course i remember the greens when they first appeared in germany in the late 1970s and early 1980s at that time, they were a anti-war peace party committed to nuclear disarmament, wanting to avoid becoming entangled in wars and conflicts around the world. Obviously, deeply concerned about ecological matters because they always had this technological side to them and very much anti-establishment and very critical of the United States. They have become the opposite. They're now the war party in Germany. They want they look for confrontation in every place. Uh, they support the war in Ukraine. They take the most uh, extreme pro-American positions on every topic. Um, and as you absolutely rightly say, they can give the impression of hating Russia and of hating China. Uh, you know, the economics minister of Germany won't visit one of Germany's critical trading partners, the country that has been perhaps most important in ensuring Germany's recent relative economic success. Um, I mean, he won't go there. I mean, it is it is beyond extraordinary, actually. And I'm sure you're right. I mean, I'm sure the Chinese 
well, I don't think they told Schultz to bring Baerbock and Harbeck along. I, I did. That's what the Chinese yeah. do. But I yeah. think Schultz would have known perfectly well that the Chinese would not have been happy to see Harbeck and Baerbock come along. But, I mean, we come back to this underlying question. Why are they like this? I don't know. At some point in their history, there was political capture by the Western Atlanticist establishment over the Greens. How it came about, what happened, I simply don't know. But somewhere along the line, it happened. And I mean, it has been a disaster for Europe. I think in the long term, it's going to be a disaster for the Greens. I think it's going to discredit them completely. Um, and of course, it's done. Well, I mean, it's it's been instrumental. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, um, I remember what you're saying because I remember some time ago the green, uh, the green peas, right? That that they were very mm. brief people, right? That yeah. they would go, they, they would go to you know the tiny boat. They would surround the oil tanks, and then I remember the Japanese uh, whale hunting was mm. lots of time disrupted mm. by the green peas people. Mm. You no, know, they were really uh, very very principled and they very strong headed, want to mm. protect the environment, all that kind of thing. Now it's all gone. It's all about, I don't know what they're, they're doing. Like you said, well, they, what the wars, et cetera, right? I mean, there is an ecological side, but of course it's purely within Europe. I mean, you know, they, they, they don't want nuclear power stations, for example. I mean, uh -huh. but one gets the sense with the Greens that this is actually less important for them now than um, advancing the EU integration project. They've committed supporters of the European Union, the most fervid probably that you will find, and at the same time taking a very strong Atlanticist position, promoting so-called Western values, yeah. which means in effect supporting US foreign policy. Now, I, as I said, how it came about, how it changed like this, it's, it's very difficult to understand. Um, it, I remember the original Green leaders from the 1980s, people like uh, Petra Kelly and her, her, her partner, General Bastian. And um, I mean, they would not recognize their own party from these positions. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. They'd say, look, I mean, China may have its, you know, we might not like all that they do. We might not like the fact that they use coal in their yeah. energy mix. I mean, you know, they talk like that. I mean, that's that's the right to do that. I mean, you know, they can talk like that. But on the other hand, you know, they're far ahead of us in electric cars. They are very far ahead of us in solar panels. Maybe we ought to be uh, looking at what they do and trying to reproduce it in Europe and perhaps work with them to do that. That is what Petra Kelly and Bastian would have said. And they would certainly not have wanted to take a you know line of conflict and war with uh, um, China. But Petra Kelly and Bastian died in circumstances that have never been satisfactorily explained. It was alleged that it was a joint suicide. I know there are people who have their doubts. Okay. Uh, um, um, and at some point, somewhere along the line, everything changed. And um, the leaders of the Green Party, Baerbock and Habeck, as I said, have come out completely differently. I, I mean, to say it frankly, I, I've heard that the party was heavily infiltrated by the various intelligence services, uh, that there's been an awful lot of blackmailing of people involved in it, um, that <laughs> Kelly and Bastian were put out of the way and that, you know, the whole thing was turned round and flipped. Now, you know, I'm not saying that's what happened because I don't know. All I'm saying is I know a lot of people think it. Yeah. And also before uh, Charles came, apparently he had a video conference with Macron. Now they talked about uh, U Ukraine, but also um, because Scholz is coming to China. So one of the things they were talking about is called the rebalancing EU-China trade relations. So my question is, is EU has a coordinated policy towards China or now like every country is just doing their own stuff and working with China individually? Because we know Hungary, for example, has very good relationship with China. OK, mm. now Hungary has always been pretty independent. 
Um, but also like a Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, visited China. And now I also read that Maloney, uh, Italian Prime Minister, is coming to visit China too. So our countries pretty much, they deal with China individually now, not EU coordinated. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, can I just make again a point, which we touched on last week? We see how Beijing has become the center of international diplomacy, that all the top people want to go there. And we see all the <laughs> European leaders doing that. And that is a huge change in international relations. And we should not just ignore that fact. You know, we shouldn't just accept this. It, 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 it is something that is going to shape the future, <laughs> that uh, world affairs are no longer being decided in North America and Europe in the way that they used to be, that even the Europeans are coming. Now, every country in Europe has its own China policies. And it's important to say this. So Macron, known to be intensely jealous and antagonistic to Scholz, he is uh, uh, curious that the Scholz is going to China. Of course, he went to China about a year ago, was absolutely yeah. you know, dazzled by what he heard and saw there. He's going to be receiving the Chinese fairly soon. Xi Jinping, I think, is going yeah. back to France. So, I mean, you know, he wants to he wants to be there. He wants to remind the Chinese, well, you know, I'm here too. You know, it's not just Schultz. I do am the big leader of Europe. Maloney is even more interesting because, of course, as when she became prime minister, she took a very strong Atlantis pro-American anti-Chinese position. She took... Uh, Italy, I think, out of a lot of the agreements and relationships that had been forged with China. And now she seems to be reversing course. And the fact that they're all going, Mark Rutte as well, it tells you that they do want to maintain good, strong, stable relations with China. Mm. And they don't trust the European Commission to do it for them because they realize that the European Commission is in America's pocket. So they're all going by themselves instead. Now, in terms of Maloney's uh, visit, it's kind of interesting. I saw an, uh, some analysis in China that the, apparently the pharmaceutical industry is pretty important for Italy. And the one of the big market is in China. So um, Maloney, maybe they're just speculations that the, their own it, Italian's own pharma industry is putting some pressure on her because they don't want to see what is going to happen, what happened to the chips industry. That if you start mm -hmm. sanctioning China, stop you know working with China, mm -hmm. well then China will say, okay, we will just develop our own pharma industry. And when China does that, not only China will produce something that to satisfy the Chinese market it will come out of China. It will become a competitor of the pharmaceutical companies from Italy. So there is this sort of speculation is that Maloney kind of like, among other things, want to ensure mm. China, okay, we want to continue to do business and we're not going to you know, sanction you or do something. So um, feel free to work with our pharma company, um, et cetera. Mm. So that's one speculation. Do you think there's some probably some merit? Oh, it? absolutely. I have absolutely no doubt that that's the case uh, at all. That makes complete sense. But um, again, you need to know Italy. I mean, the thing to think to say about Italy, and I think if you look at its economic and industrial structure, it isn't widely understood. I mean, Italy is the second biggest industrial power in within the EU after Germany. It's ahead of France. It's got a bigger industrial base than France. But it's different from the German or the French in the sense that what Italy the industrial structure in Italy is made up of large numbers of family-owned companies. And Italy, of course, is the great place of brands. I have lots of contacts with people in Italy. I mean, Italy is my neighborhood, if you like. I mean, I'm Greek, remember? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, very, we're very, very close. Now, for these people, it, it, China has been one of their most important markets. I mean, not just the pharmaceutical industry, but, you know, every you know, people who make clothes, people who make watches, which they do, people who make expensive things, people who make machine tools. China, uh, it, Italy is a major maker within the European Union of machine tools. For them, 
China is an absolutely indispensable market. Now, the other thing you need to understand about Italy is that unlike Germans or Britons, they don't have any ideological hang-ups about mm. China at all. I mean, they you know they listen to what the Americans say. The Chinese are about to take over the world. I'm not talking about the political class. I'm talking about the business community <laughs> and the wider Italian population. That doesn't interest them in the slightest. So they absolutely don't care about any of that. Um, what they are saying to themselves is, is good relations with China good for my family, my business, for Italy and for me? And if the answer is yes, they would say, let's go ahead and do it. So th this is a very, very different outlook. It's, by the way, the same with Russia. If you want to find the one country in Europe, for example, where the media landscape is much far more sceptical about the collapse in relations with Russia and the Ukraine war, you go to Italy. And in Italy, the political debates and dialogues are profoundly different. And of course, with China, even more so. And one more, one more country that is coming, seems like coming to visit China, trying to thaw the relationship is Canada. So uh, mm -hmm. I also read that the Canadian Deputy Foreign Affairs uh, Minister, David Mar Morrison, he is planning to visit China soon. Now, China and the Canada relationship has gone down really bad since the 2018 mm -hmm. when Canada kidnapped uh, Meng Wanzhou. So, and since then, there has been all kinds of a uh, uh, Different, different kinds of conflicts. They even accuse China for uh, interfering their uh, elections, which is totally outlandishly wrong. Mm. I mean, why would China do that? In particular, they were trying to imply that China somehow support Justin Trudeau. Why would China support that? I think China would never forgive Justin Trudeau for what he did mm. with Mo Wanzhou. Mm. China feel utterly betrayed. On this matter, China feel utterly betrayed by Canada and Justin Trudeau in particular. But even so, that Canada seems like also thinking want to mitigate the relationship a little bit, isn't it? That's what they're doing. Oh, absolutely. And again, it, it demonstrates once again the massive miscalculation that the Canadians made here. I mean, they, they went along with what the Americans wanted and um, they have found that it's not working out well for Canada. And so they're trying somehow to make up in some way. And that's why they're going. I mean, notice that it's the Canadians reaching out to China rather than the other way around. Again, we go back to the point I made that Beijing is now the main capital. It's the, it's the mm -hmm. capital of international diplomacy. It's where everybody wants to go. So the Canadians are off to China. They're off to Beijing trying to repair the damage. Now, as for the theory that the Chinese would back Justin Trudeau. That is ridiculous in itself. <laughs> what I suspect the story there is, by the way, is that I suspect that America's friends in, in Canada are not entirely happy about the fact that there's another outreach on the part of Canada being made towards China. Mm -hmm. And they're starting the, uh, the usual scare story about China trying to influence Canada's elections. Nobody has ever explained to me, by the way, how such a thing is even possible. Yeah. How can China influence elections in Canada? What are they supposed to do? You know, uh, uh, fund someone? <laughs> Immediately detected. The intelligence agencies would find that out at once. Uh, uh, you know, say, you know, we want John Trudeau to win. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the whole thing is just so so stupid that you know it, it again beggars belief that people promote these ideas and actually fall for them. Yeah, I mean, China to this day still very much feel betrayed of all the places because China had always a really good relationship with Canada ever since yeah. <laughs> Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau. Yeah. Right, he's yeah. the one who recognized China, the new China. Right. Yeah, so he. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree. And, you know, by the way, um, the Chinese are not the only people. I mean, um, if we're talking about a country that has reversed its approach to foreign policy in the last few years, Canada is, is the extreme example. 
they were always very, you know, uh, um, multi multinationalist, supportive of UN missions, seeking to find um, to make bridges. They were famous for their uh, for the integrity and quality of their diplomacy. Well, that's gone up in smoke. And again, how it's come about, I'm not really sure. Probably there's all kinds of reasons and stories, but I'm not that familiar with Canada, I must say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember, uh, maybe we talked about this before, that when I was mm. living in Sweden, the Canadian uh, backpacker, they, they always put a uh, can Canadian flag there. They don't want to be mixed right. with the U.S. because they're afraid mm. some people will attack the U.S., but but Canadian are the, you know, the nice guy, right? Mm. The, the stay out of guy, you know, mm. so we're not into the, in this, so you don't need to <laughs> revenge on me. So that was the, I remember that. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, no question. I mean, that is entirely correct. Um, yeah. They were we went out of their way to distinguish themselves from the Americans. And of course, during the Vietnam War, uh, yeah. Canada was hosted large numbers of young Americans who were fleeing the draft in the United States because they didn't uh -huh. want to fight in Vietnam. So, you know, th th that was the old Canada that I remember. This okay. new Canada that's appeared over the last 20 years is a very it's a very different place and again it's not entirely easy to understand it yeah. okay move to uh, china's neighbor the philippines recently mm -hmm. uh, marcos jr he uh, he announced that there's going to be no more military base um so they built two military base there but no more so him seems like the philippines softened a little bit in the meantime, there is also a report surfaced in uh, the Chinese media, but I also saw it in the West media. Now, this report is not new. It's a, it's a report in 2022. But in there, it says that the title of it is uh, Marcos Jr. continues to evade 353 million contempt judgment of the U.S. court. Now, in there, is, it clearly said that in, tw in August 2019, a new judge, Derek Watson, extended the judgment on contempt to January 25th of 2031. Now that means that there is a US judge, Derek Wilson, that can actually mm -hmm. issue a warrant at any time, isn't it, to Marcos Jr. Yeah. Isn't that what it so, means? I, that's exactly what it means. And it tells you an awful lot because it shows how pressure can be brought on someone. And in this case, Marcos Jr. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, I, I, I'm not saying that his policies would have been radically different had this case not existed, but the fact that it exists uh, and he will be aware and concerned about it affects what he does, inevitably so. I also have this question. Isn't it like a fundamentally self-determination, fully in the independent is a pretty hard thing, isn't it? I'm looking even like Britain. Is Britain a fully independent country? Looking at what's going on with the Julian Assange case. It's not a fully independent country. In no sense is it. And if you choose to become America's friend, you discover that very quickly. I mean, uh, the Americans, if you are, if you make yourself your friend, as far as they're concerned, they own you. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's how it always works out. And unless you're very careful, you find very quickly that they do actually <clears throat> own you. I mean, the, the pressure that comes from them by the way, is simply enormous. Um, I, I've you know, had people who've been in government from various countries in the world, and they talk to me about this, that the Americans are always there, they're always pushing, they're always twisting arms, they're always bullying and hectoring and demanding. And, you know, you have to, everybody who works in international affairs is, is conscious of this. So if you open the door to them, <laughs> They won't just come in through the door. They will just barge in through the door. And lots of them will. In Britain, you're absolutely correct. The Assange case is a horror. I mean, you know, as somebody who used to work in the building where the current cases are being held and used to know how the legal system used to work in my day or mm -hmm. is supposed to work, still, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I'm just lost for words to describe what has happened. I mean, as far as I can see, virtually every thing that I understood to be part of accepted legal procedure has just been 
reversed or thrown out of the window. Yeah. Yeah, the United States is very good. You know, it, it's uh, mm. it's controlling people like Marcos Jr. through these kind mm. of uh, cases, right? Mm. A contempt, which is a serious, <laughs> serious uh, crime, right? The, the court contempt. And then with Britain, I guess, just the using some different tactic, but nonetheless, also very, uh, very bullying. And talking about that, the Japanese, what do you think about the Japanese uh, Prime Minister Kishida's address to the U.S. Congress? Mm. Now, in China, there is some, some people, uh, they're, circulating saying that his speech, the whole speech was written by a US speech writer. I haven't found any supporting documents, but <clears throat> listen to his speech. I actually feel like it's very much the US tone. So at the very minimal, I would think, think this address is heavily influenced by the US. What do you think? Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, you know, again, we always hear about this difficult relationship between China <clears throat> and Japan. And, you know, there's lots of history between mm -hmm. China and Japan. But 20, 10 years ago, it wasn't like this. Japan, anyway, has an interest in actually sorting out its problems with China. What do they think the Chinese are going to do? Invade them? <laughs> Conquer them? <laughs> Change their government? Take over their country? I mean, I can't imagine that there's anyone in Japan who seriously believes that. So... It makes far better sense for Japan to maintain a good relationship with China. It makes complete economic sense. I have appliances um, in this house, my house in London, which are have Japanese labels. But when you look underneath, you can see they are made in China. In other words, they were made by factories in China, producing goods for Chinese, for Japanese companies. And there's <laughs> an awful lot of that going on. And it, it, this was and i can remember you know in the 1980s for example enormous enthusiasm but when the japanese said to themselves you know china is opening up this is our great opportunity we'll get over all the problems we'll sort out we we'll get a peace treaty which they did by the way we can forge ahead our relations with china make a friendship with china instead we now see this staunch pro-American position to be taken by the Japanese, uh, playing up again the old conflicts, reviving the old conflicts, um, resulting in all sorts of very unpleasant and frankly dangerous people in Japan itself being encouraged to behave in reckless and unpleasant ways. It doesn't help Japan but it does help the United States because the United States knows that if it is going to take on China, it needs allies and it cannot achieve anything in the Pacific without Japan. And one of the sentences got the attention in China is Ukraine mm -hmm. today, maybe East Asian tomorrow. And he got a round of applause, you know, for this sentence a bit. Lots of people in China was like, seriously, do you want to be the Ukraine of East Asian tomorrow? I was going to make exactly that point. Why? Why would Japan, uh, uh, you know, envy the fate of Ukraine? You know, staunch American ally, which is being smashed to pieces, even as we're speaking. I mean, is that really what Japan wants? Yeah. Does that really is that really a comparison that a Japanese leader would want to make? I think you're absolutely right, by the way. I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Americans had actually written the speech. Something, uh, yeah. It's certainly, certainly, it was carefully negotiated in advance. Mm -hmm. I mean, that of that I have no doubt. Yeah. Another uh, thing about China is that recently there's an, also an article got lots of attention. Uh, mm -hmm. The title, the article's title is Americans' Competition with China Must Be Won, Not Managed. This is the Foreign Affairs. So... The mm -hmm. author, the reason this article got uh, attention is because the author, one is uh, Matt Pottinger. He was the Trump Deputy National Security Advisor. I think he's focusing on Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And then Mike Gallagher, he just left the Congress. He was the chair of the House China Committee. So those two are, you can say, next generation, younger generation uh, politicians or influencers, right, in Washington. So in this article, what is remarkable to me is they actually dismiss this detente, which I thought was the the cornerstone of the Cold War, how the Cold War was managed. 
that it mm. didn't turn into a hot war, into a nuclear war mm. because of the detente. But they totally mm. dismissed that. I'm surprised. Mm. I, I would say a little bit shocked by that. What is your view on this? Well, it is profoundly shocking and it completely misguided and it tells us how incredibly dangerous these people are. But of course, we should not lose sight of the utter absurdity of this. Win against China. When has anybody won against China ever time? <laughs> I mean, you, you you know more about Chinese history than me, but, you know, think of all the people who come up against China in the, you know, 3,000 years that the Chinese state has existed. I mean, you know, the Xiongnu, I'm pronouncing them correctly, the Mongols, yeah. the, uh, you know, the Japanese, uh, um, you name them. Um, you're going to win against that? <laughs> that's really what you're talking about? That's, that's what you're thinking you're going to do? Is it much more likely that they'll win against you? I mean, it's it's. I mean, or it, assuming, of course, that you don't destroy the world in the pl- in the process. I mean, the, the whole thing is crazy. I mean, it is lunacy. It, it it shows a degree of hostility and belligerence and arrogance that is off the scale. And you know, it's published. You said you said in Foreign Affairs. In other words, by the Council for Foreign Relations. I mean, it is. it tells you that some people in America are straightforwardly mad. Why would you want to do that anyway? I mean, why would you want to talk about winning instead of managing relations? And, and what, mean, does, what does even winning mean? Are they going to occupy what, China? I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. Right? Well, that's... Ex- that is exactly correct. What what does it even mean? I mean, I don't know. I don't know whether these people themselves know. I think if they felt that they were in a position of advantage, one could imagine all kinds of terrible scenarios starting to appear. Um, I remember reading, this is 30 years ago, a, a crazy book, a really crazy book. I, I never finished it, in which it spoke about the need to break up China. <laughs> I mean, you know, serious things of that kind. I mean, you know, uh, in other words, uh, an outright straightforward attack on the Chinese people. But that was 30 years ago when China was a lot less powerful than it is today. So I don't know what these people think that they're doing or talking or saying, but it, 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 it is very frightening that they're talking in this way at all. They also want to uh, split up uh, Russia, isn't it? Divide it into several pieces or something. Decolonizing, decolonizing it as they like to call it. Exactly. And no doubt they'll do. They'll want to do the same. So you know, start with Xinjiang, go on to Tibet, (laughs) presumably Manchukuo and all that. I mean, you know, we start getting into that kind of world. I mean, but these are these are uh, lunatic plans. But that doesn't make the people who hold them any more dangerous. Um, ultimately, it's not about winning against China. It is maintaining the hegemonic position of the United States indefinitely, um, and that they are able that they're prepared to talk in this um, terrifying way tells you the lengths to which some people are prepared to go in the United States to preserve that. Now, recently, I saw your conversation with uh, your uh, colleague. Uh... Alex uh, Christofaro and uh, Mearsheimer. Okay. No. Now, Mearsheimer was very interesting. He talked about the Iran. You guys were talking about the situation in Iran. And he had a very good point to saying, well, if you really want to deter Iranian from developing all these you know, military ad- uh, gears, etc., stop threatening Iran, right? Stop mm-hmm. irritating Iran and poking you know, Iran. Mm-hmm. And exactly the mm-hmm. same can be said about China. If Absolutely. you really want China to you know, not developing advanced weapons, etc., Stop surrounding China with the military bases, right? And then mm-hmm. stir troubles in its neighbors and then sanction China, all, all these kind of a threatening things. But they can't. They, they seem mm-hmm. like they all, the only way they know is to threaten Iran, threatening China with military bases, with irritations around their neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, isn't it? That's absolutely correct. That's all they seem to know. That's all they seem to understand. Now, uh, uh, Professor Mearsheimer, who, by the way, um, has made his own criticisms of China, mm-hmm. but does so with, and I think this is a point people perhaps don't realize, an immense respect for the country and visits it often. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, he is in despair about this style of 
policy, you know, endless, pointless belligerence, which is incredibly dangerous and leads to one defeat after another uh, it, uh, and might ultimately bring about a crisis that could sweep us all away. He's in despair about it. And so in the West, all of us should be. One of the most alarming and frightening things is that these ludicrous ideas are being spread, uh, not just being spread, but are being acted on. Bon, you talked about, you know, the military bases in, around China, the talk about establishing missile stations on, is it the second or the third island chain? I forget which one. Uh, all, all that kind of thing. Um, people ought to be coming out in America and in Europe and saying, stop, this doesn't make sense. What are we doing? Do we really want to get into a war with the Chinese? Can't we find some way to deal with them instead? Isn't this going to get us into another mess with China, just like the mess we got into over Ukraine? These debates don't happen. Yeah. And that is the most frightening thing of all. Now, if there is some um, comforting, I just want to share with you, there is also some discussion in the Chinese media I find very interesting is that uh, in Asia, there seems like, a, despite that they are differences, right? Uh, but there does seem like there is some consensus, which is the United States, um, if you want us to get war, you need to get here. You need to fight the war. So even the Philippines, they don't say that straight out, but it seems like their action is, okay, if you want us to start a war with China, you need to be here, and then we will join you. Now, of course, the United States wants is, okay, you start a fight with China, we will give you the weapons, the money, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the, even the Philippines, it seems to make that clear. And mm -hmm. not only that, Japan probably is the same thing, and a lesser degree, Taiwan, but Taiwan is a, a different kind of a situation. But it, mm -hmm. in any event, mm -hmm. doesn't seem to China, Taiwan even dare to start mm -hmm. uh, a war with the mainland. More importantly, even China seems like have that attitude. It's like, I'm not going to fight you, proxy. If you're going to fight me, you need to come here to fight the United States. So that means, you know, I'm, because you mm. when you're fighting a proxy, it's the U.S. proxy. It means U.S. is behind. U.S. does not get mm. hurt. It's all mm. the other countries like the Philippines and maybe, you know, and then China itself. So what China's attitude is like, you want to start a fight. You come here, start fighting me, and I will fight back. But mm. I'm not going to fight your proxies. So that seems like a, almost like the consensus in, in Asia now, watching what's going on in Ukraine, because clearly Zelensky is desperately want the United States to get in, right? Mm. <laughs> it's He's at the end of his rope almost like, but the mm. Asian can see that. And then the consensus is we are not going to do the proxy. I think that, well, th what do you think? No, I think that's absolutely right. I think that is perhaps also a consequence of the war in Ukraine. Um, and of course, all of the other wars as well, but first and foremost of Ukraine, that fighting America's wars for it is a completely wasted, uh, it, it, it is, is it, it's a disaster for you. It enables the Americans to hide behind you and they can engage in all kinds of astonishing rhetoric, but it's you who pay the price and the Americans can walk away. <laughs> And the Asians are saying, you know, we're, we're not going to be put in that position. You know, we're not going to be put in a position where we invite our own destruction upon ourselves at your bidding. And then you can just walk away from the disaster and leave us and leave us in that situation by ourselves. And the Chinese are saying, we're not going to let you do that anyway. I mean, if you want to start creating conflicts and problems in the Pacific. You must understand, you know, we are you are actively involved, even if you want to hide behind others. We're not going to play the game of proxies. This isn't chess. I mean, this is this is something quite different. Now, that isn't what the Americans like. The Americans do not like to be directly involved in wars, especially against what they call peer adversaries countries as powerful, or in fact, in some respects, more powerful than themselves. That isn't what they do. So, you know, that is already going to um, affect American conduct in the Pacific. Yeah. 
which means if the if the U.S. is not going to get involved directly, uh, for now mm. at least, uh, uh, there shouldn't be any major conflict in Asia. At least that's I think it's a, it's a good thing, right? Well, that's the theory, of course. Always, and one mustn't underestimate. There's always this people who are ambitious or foolish or reckless or easily <laughs> bribed or naive who come along and believe the American promises and allow yeah. their visceral feelings born of grievances that might be one or two hundred years old to come out and play themselves out so i'm afraid one can never ever um relax um when there is a country like the united states coming to one's region trying to mess up everything and spoil things and set people off against each other but yes it is a restraint and that is important in europe by the way um, that didn't apply. The Ukrainians, disastrously, were enthusiastic about joining this crusade. Yeah. They thought that with the Americans behind them, they would prevail. They've always had this resentment that the capital of the great Eastern Slav state is in Moscow and not in Kiev. Mm -hmm. And there's a long history to explain this, which I'm not going to discuss now. So they thought, with America's backing, we can defeat the Muscovites. They, that's what they call them, by the way. They call the Russians Muscovites. And we will, we will win out. And of course, they're now discovering that, you know, if America makes you promises, it doesn't follow that those promises will be fulfilled, at least not in the way that you think. So, you know, always there is a risk that you'll find some fool. <laughs> to say it simply, <laughs> in Asia, who will play along with this. But Asian leaders in general are not fools. The United States has less control, I think, over Asian polis political cultures than it does over European ones. Yeah. And so that does make it a lot less likely that we will see the same kind of conflict in Asia than, than the one we've seen in Europe. Well, then, then let's move to uh, Middle East. Then. Um, mm -hmm. it, I feel Iran has been very restrained as well. Mm -hmm. So um, the U.S. and the, the Israelis claim they intercepted 99% of the attack, mm -hmm. et cetera, uh, which seems like, okay, well, fine. Now, of course, the Iranians saying they, they got the targets they want. Okay, mm -hmm. so they, they targeted some military bases, military mm -hmm. uh, targets, and they, they all got them, and including, I think, one of the buildings belonged to the Mossad or something. I, I find, okay, both sides declare some kind of a victory. Well, then, good. Everybody ha happy, right? So let's just move on. But mm. no, um, the U.S. now, I just read that the U.S. It's, uh, apparently the U.S. is trying to convince Iran to allow a symbolic strike by Israel. Why Why would they do that? Now, mm. clearly, the, the Iranians have declined it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be leaked. And then also the, the, the Israeli war cabinet now saying that they are going to hit back forcefully at Iran. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. this was reported two days ago. We haven't seen it. But uh, it seems like within Israel, they are still very hawkish voices who want to retaliate. So we're not over this thing, is it? Oh, no, no, we're not over at all. In fact, it remains incredibly dangerous. Now, again, again, I mean, you know, I think this is entirely true what you said about Iran. Iran has faced extreme provocations for decades. <laughs> um, we've had... Assassins been sent into Iran to murder Iranian scientists. We've had assassinations, public assassinations of Iranian officials. We've had a, a, the United States regularly seizing Iranian ships on the high seas. The United States imposing all kinds of sanctions on Iran. The United States agreeing to a nuclear deal with Iran that it then reneges on. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, this has been going on for years with threats and uh, one threat after another, attempts to prevent Iran's economic development, attempts to incite uprisings against the Iranian government. And the Iranians have taken this all and they've shown astonishing restraint over the years. Many, many countries would not have shown the same degree of restraint that Iran has done. But Iran has shown that restraint because well, to say it simply, and this is the thing people perhaps don't understand, it's a very old country, it's a very old civilization, 
they too have an understanding of statecraft mm -hmm. and they can see what the Americans and, and the Israelis are trying to do, lead them into another war, which would lead ultimately to the breakup or destruction of Iran. Well, I think what happened at the start of this month was something that Israel did, which went too far, mm -hmm. which is attacking the Iranian embassy in Damascus. And of course, that is the equivalent to attacking Iranian territory. Mm -hmm. And the Iranians said, look, if we just sit back and let that happen, they'll just go on doing more and more of this. And, um, you know, at some point, the, the, the point will come when uh, we're, you know, we're pushed into a corner and we might seriously start to risk everything. So we've got to respond. But even then, when they did respond, they were very careful. They'd consulted the Americans. There's been an article in the Financial Times for, before the attack, which said that the Iranians were in discussions with the Americans. They basically told the Americans what they wanted to do. They were careful to attack only mi military sites rather than civilian ones. They clearly weren't out to cause huge numbers of casualties. Um, they put on, in other words, a show of force. And they said, look, we'll leave it at that. We don't want to go any further. They also, by the way, before they launched their strike, went to the UN Security Council, fact which has hardly been reported, and said, you know, if we, if the Security Council is prepared to issue a statement criticizing the, Iran the Israeli attack on our embassy, we will accept that. We won't take any further action. And of course, the Americans vetoed it. So, because a, 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 um, a, a um, statement was drafted, but the Americans made it clear that they would not let it pass. So, Iran has behaved with extreme, extreme restraint in the face of the most extreme provocations. I forgot to mention, by the way, that there are a whole chain of television radio channels controlled by the United States, positioned all around Iran, broadcasting anti-government propaganda into Iran day in, day night, day out. I gather on a scale that you will not see with any other country. So the Iranians, as I said, they've acted with colossal restraint in the face of all of this. Coming back to the original attack on their embassy, they had to say, look, so far, but no further, we can't accept anymore. We certainly can't accept symbolic attacks on our territory. What does that even mean? So now the Americans, who do not really want a war with Iran, they <laughs> understand that Iran is a powerful country in spite of everything. And it's not as powerful as China, it's not as powerful as Russia, but it is a powerful country. They do not want a war with Iran. So they're trying to control their Israeli ally, they're telling the Israelis take the win, don't uh, press on, don't attack, don't do anything. The Israelis themselves have their own agenda. They're losing the war in Gaza. Now admissions, even in the Wall Street Journal, that that is so. Uh, they are uh, facing an immense political crisis at home. Their economy is in a tailspin. Um, so what do they do? They look for another war to distract attention and to get themselves out of their political diff difficulties and hope also that they can drag the Americans in. So that's why we are now having this um, push and pull between the Americans and the Israelis. The Israelis want to hit hard. The Americans say, please, please don't do that. We don't want a general war. And well, we'll see which of the two prevails. The Israelis, who clearly do want to go in very hard, or mm -hmm. the Americans who would rather that the Israelis didn't go in and launch a strike at all. I, I feel like Biden doesn't really want to get in and uh, he has yeah. a lot of support. But at the same time, John, you know, people like John Bolton, he doing oh, the weekends yeah. saying all kinds of awful things on the on the CNN. Uh, what kind of places, the, you know, you can hit Iran here and there. I mean, he has a whole plan to how to hit Iran, yeah. right? And and then you combine that with what I talk about, the people like the Pottinger and the Gallagher, you know, all these hawkish people. There's still a group of very, uh, you know, hawkish people that are very utterly dangerous, but all these people have some influence, right? So it's not so sure that nothing will happen, isn't it? 
Oh, no, it's not sure at all. I mean, uh, you know, this is the thing. Uh, one fears that eventually the day will come when these very dangerous people will gain control. <laughs> and then we could find ourselves in an incredibly dangerous crisis. But uh, more likely than not, and I'm not, you know, putting any money on this, I think that because there's an election in the United States yeah. this mm -hmm. year, and because the Biden administration understands that the American, the wider American public does not want another war in the Middle East with the United States involved in it. They will find some way to pull this back. But all that's going to do is it's going to make the Pottingers and the Boltons and people like that even more angry and determined to start their war, which is what they're aching for at the next opportunity. They've been wanting a war with Iran for decades and they're very close to getting it now and they will be extremely angry if they don't get it so that will only make them even more determined to push harder for their war next time round yeah one thing i don't understand about the netanyahu go against the mm. jcpoa now jcpoa was uh barack obama was uh, uh initiated to in, in exchange of Iran stop de de develop its nuclear weapons and, and then the, the US will, will uh, lift the sanctions. Well, I understand that Netanyahu doesn't like to lift sanctions on Iran, but ultimately that means Iran will stop developing nuclear weapons. Isn't that a good thing for Israel? Why is he so dead fast against that? I don't understand that. Well, because what he really wants is regime change in Iran. He doesn't want a situation where Iran um, is readmitted fully into the international community, has all the sanctions lifted, becomes a country in good standing in the Middle East, and at the same time remains, as it still would be, a strong supporter of the Palestinian people, and one which wants to see the political situation in the Palestinian territories fundamentally changed. So I think this is really what it's all about. I don't think Netanyahu is hostile to an Iranian nuclear program. He is hostile to Iran. The nuclear program that Iran has is merely the issue that he's trying to unite the Americans okay. behind Israel on. He's, you know, conjured up this specter that the Iranians are about to, you know, acquire a nuclear bomb. He's been talking about this for 20 years. They're taking a very long time to acquire that nuclear bomb, if that's what they really are after. But I mean, he's been going on and on about this, not because he really wants to stop a nuclear weapons program happening in Iran, but because he wants to bomb Iran, because he's convinced if that happens, that will res result in regime change there. Uh, he's wrong about that, by the way. But then I don't think Netanyahu knows Iran, understands Iran very well. And that's another problem. Yeah. And one more thing that uh, happened is that the, the U.S. sanction, um, the U.S. Congress also sanctioned China. Not many mm. people pay attention for buying Iranian oil. They just passed that in the House uh, overwhelmingly, 383 to mm. 11 votes. Uh, not sure when it's going to go to the Senate. But I, I just find this thing is it's another strange thing that they're doing to punish China. First of all, everything is China's fault now. And but when they do that, they essentially force China and Iran to abandon dollar. I'm, I'm sure, I mean, not that they are using dollar now, but another reason uh, to ditch the dollar altogether. Do they really know what they're doing? Um, no, they do no, they don't know what they're doing. And you're absolutely right. China's to blame for everything. Russia's the, winning the war in Ukraine. China's to blame. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a crisis in the Middle East. China's to blame. Iran's economy hasn't collapsed. China's to blame. Everything is China's fault. And you know, I read there was an article I was reading the other day in the British media that all these wars are connected with each other. The fact that there's a crisis in the Middle East and the fact that there's a crisis in uh, uh, you know Ukraine um, and the fact that people are buying gold, <laughs> putting pressure on the dollar, that's that's China. You see that the Chinese are out to take over the world, so they're distracting and they're causing all this trouble. No, they don't know what they're doing. First of all, I mean, they have this paranoid idea about whoever the current adversary is, 
and American paranoia shifts, <laughs> by the way, from one target to the next. At the moment, it's China. Soon it'll be some other country. Um, at the same time, they have this extraordinary belief in their own power that, you know, we can just pass the sanctions on China over the fact that China is importing oil from Iran. And lo and behold, <laughs> either China won't stop importing oil from Iran, in which case Iran collapses, or China facing these terrible sanctions, China collapses. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of, that's the only kind of logic there is to this. But I mean, it, it, it's, it's, ridiculous it's absurd policy what it is actually doing and i've said this many times is he causing enormous amount of disruption to world trade because there are now so many sanctions over so many people with all these threats of second reach sanctions applying all the time that if you're a ship owner now you know i'm getting i'm a greek i know all about that if you're a ship owner and you go to say a port in uh, P Pakistan to load goods there and they come from a Chinese company you don't know whether or not you might be sanctioned if you accept those goods because that Chinese company may have a shareholder with another Chinese company which has shares in another company which is buying oil from Iran so I mean that that is the kind of nightmare that you find yourself in and it is having a major catastrophic effect on world trade the side effect is that that making people want to use dollar even less, right? Well, that, exactly, which yeah. is, of course, uh, uh, precisely the source now of America's power, yeah. because it is no longer the world's first industrial country. That yeah. went, what, 10 years ago. It's no longer the world's biggest military power. The Ukraine war has demonstrated that in the starkest terms. Um, but it does still control the global financial system. So what do you do? <laughs> you abuse your control of the global financial system and you incentivize people to create another one. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. Now about Ukraine, <laughs> I also read this article. The Wall Street Journal is saying that the U US defense of Israel sky spark Ukrainian envy and ire. So Zelensky apparently expressed frustrations after the U.S. and its allies swamped in to defend uh, Israel against a massive Iranian attack over the weekend. And it's highlighting the limits of Western support for Kiev. So this is the, what the article says. Now, of course, Zelensky is envy about that. I mean, by now, Zelensky must know he is just a chip, right? He's a pawn. And so mm -hmm. how can he not understand that this is this how this game is played? But but recently, I think it, Blinken also dangled this NATO membership again, something. Now, is by this time mm. the only thing that uh, Zelensky thinking, as long as Ukraine can get into NATO, then all these things is still worthwhile. Is that what he's still hanging on to? Yes, it is exactly what he's going to hang on to. But again, I just go back to that Wall Street Journal article, because, of course, even they're getting it completely wrong. You know, envy because, you know, the United States is happy to shoot down Iranian missiles over Israel and uh, uh, won't shoot down um, uh, Russian missiles over Ukraine. It's not because the Americans are making a choice there. They're not choosing to defend Israel and choosing not to defend Ukraine. It's not as if this is a, you know, a simple choice. The fact is the Russians are very powerful, far more powerful than the Iranians are. The Americans know perfectly well if their airplanes enter Ur Ukrainian airspace and try shooting down uh, um, um, Russian missiles, they seriously risk having their own aircraft shot down. That doesn't exist, that fear doesn't exist over Israel. An American plane flying over Israel is not going to be shot down by Iran. The Iranians don't have that capability. The Russians do. And that's the fundamental difference. And the problem always again is that the American, uh, the Western media, American politicians, American media, never face up to these essential power realities that they don't ever want to acknowledge that there is a limit to American power, 
-hmm. they always frame it in terms of choice. America chooses to support Israel. America doesn't choose to support Ukraine in the same way. And Zelensky does the same thing. So I, I think that's a fundamental thing always to understand. Now, does Zelensky not understand how the game is played? Obviously not. I mean, I think that's one of the other problems with the Ukrainians. They went into this adventure with this wildly exaggerated sense of American power and this wildly exaggerated sense of Russian weakness. They thought that the Americans are so much more powerful than the Russians that obviously if the Ukrainians had the support of the Americans, they would prevail. And I sense that deep down, many of them in Ukraine still think that. They still think that the Americans have the power to defeat the Russians for them. And this is why you're now getting out of Ukraine, this narrative of betrayal, because that's what it is. But ultimately, it's, it's not facing the actual realities, both in the the United States and in Ukraine, that the extent of Russian power has been critically underestimated. Yeah, yeah. They, they totally misstated the situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, how long can they last the Ukrainian um, fight? Uh, one of uh, the uh, South media person in China, he went deep into Ukraine. No, so he mm. actually had a pretty interesting uh, observation. Now, this guy, he made it very clear he's not supporting either side. He just wants mm. to show people. Okay. Mm. So on the one hand, he is showing the front, the, the places that totally devastated in Ukraine. But then also, uh, I guess, Kiev and some other big or some other big city, mm. people seem the life is, is still just as, mm. as usual. Mm. One of the problem he's commenting on is that the people who are in Kiev and the decision makers, they don't feel the war the devastation of the war. So my question is, now Russia should know this, right? Why doesn't the Russian um, put some pain, like a bombing places to really, you know, let the, the Ukrainians feel some pain so that they mm. can know what war really is, what really is going on so that they will be more hurried to, to finish those whole, this whole thing and this. The this is this these are questions which of course are, i i mean we we don't know what the russian thinking is and what exactly it is that the russians uh, why why they're not making these decisions by the way that very question that you just put to me is often asked within russia itself if you go to okay. russian telegram channels they say you know why why are we not doing all kinds of things which we should be doing why are we not attacking the bridges over the Dnieper river when we can okay. why aren't we not destroying them? why aren't we attacking the decision making centers of kiev why aren't we hunting zelensky and uh, um all of the others why aren't we just devastating kiev we obviously have the capabilities to yeah. do all of these things but why don't we do them now i don't think anybody has a simple explanation for this um the only people who know fully are the kremlin but I think that there are some explanations which we can perhaps work out. Firstly, I think that the Russians want a slow war because mm -hmm. they worry that mm -hmm. if there is an uncontrolled and sudden collapse in Ukraine, that would be difficult for them to control, given mm -hmm. that the army that they started out with was relatively small. And they have to take time, in other words, to build up their forces to the point where they can take advantage of things like that. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The second is that I think the Russians also calculate that if they start behaving in that kind of way, there is a risk that the Americans and the Europeans might panic and might start doing reckless things like what Macron was talking about, sending troops into Ukraine, which would be a problem a major problem and a complication for the Russians. Thirdly, I think that there is, an in, there is the international dimension. The Russians also know that as important to winning the military campaign against Ukraine and the West in Ukraine is winning the political campaign around the world, persuading countries like Brazil, China, 
critically important country, India, all of the others, that the Russians are being reasonable, that they're not out to destroy Ukraine, kill all the Ukrainian people, devastate the country, do all of those things. And I think that is probably an important factor, one which ought not to be underestimated. Um, and lastly, and this is, I think, something which outsiders find very difficult to understand. I think that some Russians, and particularly President Putin himself, have inhibitions against doing this. Not just because, you know, this is an abstract humanitarian thing, but because Russians and Ukrainians are so close that a lot of Russians still think of Ukrainians as being fundamentally their own people. Kiev used to be Russia's capital, capital city. And launching those kind of attacks against the first capital of Russia, the place where the oldest church in the Russian Orthodox Church is, there are still, I think, factors that hold the Russians back from doing that. So I, I've given you a whole list of reasons. I'm not sure whether all of them apply or only some of them or none of them, whether maybe there's some other reason or plan. But, I mean, one can perhaps, if you just take a step back, think about it hard, talk to Russians themselves, by the way. You, you tend to hear explanations like this. Yeah, I also wonder whether um, for Putin, it sounds to me like it, it's very important to really decimate the uh, Nazi factions within yeah. Ukraine. To yes. do that, probably also, you know, a long war, like you said, a slow long war can do yeah. that versus yeah. a, a total collapse. Those elements still in there, right, without totally clean them out. Probably that's also part of it, I guess. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is something which the Russians fully understand. Westerners don't. But the, the Russians remember, for example, how the Americans swept into Iraq in 2003, mm -hmm. uh, occupied or seemed to occupy the whole country within about three weeks, and then discovered that they couldn't control it. And the Russians do not want to be put in that position. They mm -hmm. want to break Ukrainian resistance. Their major objective, and this is very much consistent with their military doctrines, is to destroy Ukraine's will to resist by destroying its armed forces. And they understand that that takes time, but they are single-mindedly focused on achieving that. And they've looked at past history. They see that long, slow wars that end in total victory tend to secure a stable peace, whereas blitzkrieg, lightning wars that appear very dramatic at the beginning, often turn out badly for the victors in the end. One more thing is uh, Switzerland. I, I noticed that Switzerland, there is an advocacy group called Pro Switzerland. They collect enough signatures now. They want to call for a referendum on a mm. proposed uh, constitution amendments for Switzerland neutrality. Mm. And in there, that this amendment, they actually spe specifically said that they want uh, to avoid entering any military alliance unless it is attacked, as well as not to impose any non-military coercive measures, which is sanction, I guess. Mm -hmm. So to me, and they, they uh, collected enough uh, uh, signatures now, actually more than they, they need. So this mm. is going to be a, a referendum, I guess. Sounds to me like the Switzerland people do not like what their government did to sanction Russia. They want to continue to be really neutral. Isn't it? I think that's entirely true. And I think this is a fundamental thing to understand because Swiss, Switzerland took a very strong anti-Russian line in this conflict. It imposed sanctions. It acted alongside the West. And the Russians have absolutely rightly said, you know, if you behave like this, we can't treat you as a neutral country anymore. Now, <laughs> that's very difficult for the Swiss political class to accept because, to be frank, they are very, very tied into the West. But the Swiss people, for whom neutrality has always been a religion, I can very well imagine for many of them, and, you know, a religion which has worked well for Switzerland, it should be said, for many of them, I mean, this must be uh, a shattering thing to, 
to find themselves in. Uh, I'll be very interested to see whether that referendum happens, and I wonder what the result is going to be. If the Swiss vote for this amendment, reaffirming their historic neutrality, um, I am absolutely sure that, as has happened with the Brexit vote in Britain, the Swiss political class will do everything they possibly can to undermine and nullify. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. That's why I find it's interesting, right?、Mm. I find that all these government, the Western government, they they do they do things very very rushed, and then、yeah. they also against their own people's view, their own people's、um, will. I think, I think in Sweden, if you see polling numbers,、um, majority of the Swedish do not really want to join NATO. But Sweden、yeah. joined NATO, right?、Yeah. And and and、um, there will come a day they might regret that. We will see.、Yeah. And then I also remember Finland, for example, in the beginning of、uh, the war, they、um, I don't know if you pay attention, they actually took some of the Russian arts. There is an exhibited a- exhibition in、uh, Finland. Some of the Russian arts are there, paintings, and Finland just saying we're go- not going to return them. I was horrified. I was so shocked、yeah. by that. I was like,、yeah. "What are they doing?" And I remember reading the Chinese media was saying, "Okay, we probably should never send out any of our artifacts、yeah. to Finland." Now,、yeah. then a few weeks later, Finland come to their senses, like, "Oh, no, 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 we're going to return that." But、yeah. I think the damage is done. The same、oh, thing was. I, I think the same thing with Switzerland. When they、mm. do that, when they sanction Russia, also lots of money fly out. They fly to,、mm. they move to Singapore, they move to Hong Kong.、Mm. Uh, I, I think that's probably part part of the Switzerland people was like, why are we doing this, right? But again, even if they go back to it, I think more or less the the, the damage is done. Why are、oh. they not to take the time to think it through when they're making such important changes in their policies? Well, you're absolutely correct. Why don't they?、Uh, I mean, massive changes, changes that ought to have required intense debate within these countries.、Um, the, the reason that this happened so quickly, of course, is precisely because those who wanted to make these decisions and to make these changes didn't want debate to happen. Because had there been a debate, quite probably the outcome would have been the opposite of the one they wanted. So they rushed it through, and of course you're absolutely right, because in the West we make all our decisions in this secretive way, in this very rushed way. We never properly think it through, and the results are always <laughs> bad, as we as we see. It's very difficult, I think, particularly in China. I think people don't understand in China how、um, chaotic. The decision-making process in the West has now become.、Um, political leaders don't sit down and consult experts and go through things systematically, inviting opinions, consulting widely.、Um, that isn't how it's done anymore.、Um, it's all done by small groups of people making decisions in private, often under extreme pressure from our friends. Across the ocean, so I mean that that's 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 the way it works. And you mentioned Switzerland, Finland, and、uh, Sweden. The country the Russians themselves feel most bitter about by far is, by the way, Finland. Finland is, of course, a neighbor of Russia.、Um, it was part of the Russian Empire. It was given, whilst it was part of the Russian Empire, very extensive autonomy. Um, so you know the Finnish language was strongly supported within Russia. It had its own parliament, which was the first parliament in Europe to which women could vote. By the way, just saying,、uh, um, you know. So and then after Finland gained its independence, Finland and Russia fought two wars:、uh, the、uh, Winter War and then the Second World War. There was an exchange of territory, but the Russians, who could have Imposed very, very heavy penalties on Finland, or even absorbed Finland entirely into Russia again, or imposed a communist government on Finland, which、mm. there was a big communist party in Finland at one time. They accepted that Finland would be able to continue as an independent, fully independent state, on the promise that it would always remain neutral,、mm. and that promise has now been violated. And it's it's something that has come through 
um, even ordinary Russians are very, very angry about it and feel very betrayed. And they're very unlikely to forgive Finland for what it's done. Yeah, to take the arts. I <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe it. Now, well, no, yeah. in a few weeks, they come to their senses. But yeah. can they even yeah. think about doing something like that? It was very shocking to me. It was Well, when people are doing something wrong in which they basically deep down know is wrong, they often over uh, they, they, they often go too far, even further than they should do. And I think this is one of the reasons. As I said, this is a difficult decision. Right. Well, it was a, it was an extraordinary decision that the Finns took to join NATO at all. Yeah. And in order to convince their own people of its rightness, they've had to start a massive anti-Russian propaganda campaign in Finland itself, which apparently is on a scale that is almost beyond um, what you would find in any, anywhere else. And I'm afraid the seizure of the artworks was a part of it. Yeah. And like I said, the damage is done. And now we know that Finland mm. can seize mm. your art. So don't send anything valuable to Finland. You never know. Well, it did. And the, and, and the Russians who twice forgave Finland for, mm -hmm. for being in a war. Well, you know, next time round, they won't be so forgiving. I mean, you know, that's a price the Finnish people for whom this decision was decided. I mean, it was decided for them. I mean, they didn't vote to, 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 to make this decision. The Finnish people will probably pay the price. Okay, a um, little bit light things about the pa Paris Olympic. We talked about the, this before mm -hmm. that their water are dirty, so that the triathlon, the swimming part, probably not going to happen. Well, the other aspect of the Olympic, it seems to me, the uh, they're discussing the French uh, government is is contacting like forty countries for the security now because of the situation in Ukraine, in Gaza. Uh, remember, there is a Munich massacre, mm. right? That So they really don't want something like that to be repeated. So this mm. security now has become a nightmare. In mm. the meantime, there are also people, the police and the, the, the doctors and the janitors, everybody are threatening the, the French government that they're going to strike if they don't get a raise and get additional holidays, mm. etc. The whole thing seems like a, a chaotic state now. Mm. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> it is absolutely interesting and it is very, it, it's completely unsurprising. It, I'm afraid it's also unsurprising if you know France. I mean, um, you know, I used to know France very well. I haven't been there for a long time now, but I used to know, know France extremely well. I even lived there for a time. And it was a very efficient and well-run place uh, um, in its own way. But today's France apparently is not. Last time I was there, which was, I think, in 2018, which wasn't in Paris, by the way. I, I was surprised how unfrench it has become in some ways. So, you know, it, it none of that surprises me. And a chaotic and disorganized Olympics is probably what we're going to get, which will be a shame because after yeah. all, it's supposed to be a big celebration. But there it is. Yeah. And the, the other thing is they, uh, they also stopped using Huawei's equipment for 5G, but now they don't want, there is no good communication apparently for the, for all the athletes, et cetera. So now they're going back to Huawei, ask them if they can quickly install something there. So just to, well, just what, so you know. What, what were you saying a moment ago about not thinking your decisions through? <laughs> I mean, there's an example for Yeah. Yeah, but the security thing is serious. I, I really do think right. that they uh, there will be very serious challenging security challenges mm. there. I, I do mm. think that is a serious matter. We'll, we'll Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It'd be very serious. I mean, what does I mean, I sincerely hope that nothing does go wrong, by the way. I mean, it would be a horrible thing if anything did. Yeah. But once upon a time, one could have relied on the French. I mean, mm. when I was living in Paris, by the way, um, one of the things that one noticed was how much more visible security in the police was in Paris than in London. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very tightly controlled place. I mean, the French had a very strong sense of the need for order and all of that, but apparently not anymore. Yeah, we will see. I'll be watching. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Olympics. I like it because everybody's so happy, you know, get together. Yeah. It's a big party, right? So actually, I like to, to watch the Olympics. Oh, well, I used to love them. I mean, I used to yeah. watch the Olympics with a huge pleasure. I mean, yeah. I, when there was the Olympics in Athens, I mean, you know, I was you know, very, very thrilled and very happy. Yeah. When there were the Olympics in London, I was very, very happy. I mean, they weren't organized on anything like the scale that the ones in Beijing were in 2008. Uh -huh. But, you know, they were, you know, joyful and yeah. happy events. They brought 
young people together from around the world. I mean, as an idea, I still think it's a great idea. And, um, you know, it's not quite as it was in my childhood. I remember when I was, you know, first came to London in the 60s. It was the Olympics first in 1968 and in 1972. And you used to walk down the streets and there would be all the shops with the televisions, you know, the people were, that were on sale and they'd be showing clips of the Olympics and you'd see crowds of people outside the shop windows just looking at the Olympics because it was such a big event and people were so engaged and involved in it. And it but, you know, maybe it's not quite on that scale, but it can be a very, very happy and joyful thing. And sports competitions are and should be that. Yeah. yeah. Some people, unfortunately, um, don't seem to like it when others are happy and they seem to see it is their job to ruin everybody's party. Yeah, yeah, I think you totally uh, summarize that well. Some people cannot stand to see other people happy. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you so much. Okay. Another you. interesting session with you. Great, Indeed. thank you. Indeed, okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Sophia, bye.